Uh, I am Ray Briggs and the image you will see is of a uh, person, uh, white uh, 30s of uh, sort of uh, difficult to detect gender if I'm doing things the way I want to be doing them. Uh, big glasses, a blue shirt with a design on it and uh, very short cropped hair. Uh, so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Jen Eichers, uh, who's a postdoc uh, in philosophy at uh, the University of Education in Ludwigsburg in Germany. They work on scripts and interactions in social cognition, on the social cognition of emotions, and on, on online discrimination against uh, LGBTQI plus people. Uh, they're right now part of an interdisciplinary project on digital transformation, which is one of the reasons that I'm extra excited to be chairing this talk because uh, it sort of connects with social epistemology, which is uh, one of my research interests. And one of the aspects of the project explores how uh, sort of uh, epistemic injustices that start uh, sort of outside the digital world carry over into the digital world. Uh, they're also an artist and they have some wonderful photos on their website, both of architecture and exploring queer masculinities. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Jen. Thank you, Ray. Um, okay, I am a masculine presenting person. I have dark curly hair and facial hair and behind me there's a book full of uh, a bookshelf full of books. <laughs> And it's also, I'm in Berlin and it's getting dark slowly and uh, it's snowing outside, which you can't see, but it's actually quite nice. Um, I'll start sharing my slides. Um, there's only text on the slides um, and it's text I'll speak anyway, so um, there's nothing you miss. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about pathologizing disabled and trans identities, um, how emotions become marginalized. It's a very new branch, I think, for me to explore, and it brings together a lot of the research areas I'm involved in. Um, so it's new, it's going to be exploratory and um, mostly based on examples um, and not quite so theory heavy, I think. I'm going to go into some theory, um, trying to give an understanding of what marginalization is, how I apply that to emotions, so what emotional marginalization is, and how that can be applied to disabled and trans identities, or how disabled and trans identities are affected by emotional marginalization. Okay. So marginalization is generally understood as being forced to be in the peripheries of society. Um, it comes with limited access and opportunities to political, social, and economic goods. Uh, originally, it was used to describe experiences of immigration um, by Park, according to which marginalization means a lack of integration and a status as an outsider with respect to dominant cultures. Now the concept of marginalization is applied to a broader range of phenomena addressing cultural, social, and structural forms of being excluded or of being nearly excluded. We also have some more contemporary theory that's concerned with the concept of marginalization. For example, Fricker um, says, the exclusion takes place as, or marginalization takes place as exclusion from valuable practices. And there's also Young who says uh, there's a social practice of exclusion from the workforce, um, rendering someone second class citizen, and that results in material deprivation. Um, and marginalized groups include the poor, disabled people. Uh, trans people haven't been mentioned, but I think it fits the, uh, the definition of young. Um, so everyone who is considered to be unemployable. Um, Bilson defines different kinds of marginalization. Um, 
along the lines of cultural processes, social roles, and social structures, more generally speaking. We can apply those understandings. I'm not committing to um, any specific definition. I think uh, the three definitions I presented are useful for me because I mostly rely on very social understandings of any concept basically and also of marginalization. And I think we can apply this, these definitions of marginalization to emotions. Um, so emotional marginalization can be understood as having limited access to emotional expression and recognition. I think it could also extend to having limited access to um, experiencing, experiencing some specific emotions um, or to emotionality in general, but I think that's very hard to pin down actually. So I'm going to focus more on examples that have to do with expression and recognition. I think emotional marginalization can be considered to be a kind of emotional or affective injustice. Um, there's not a lot of literature on affective injustice yet, um, but I think it's coming up more and more, in, especially in emotion theory. Um, for example, Whitney has defined affective injustice as a failure to off emotional uptake that involves um, disabling affective sense making in marginalized persons by withholding its intercorporeal conditions and disintegrating the sense and the force of affects from each other. So she argues that emotions are embodied and get their meaning through bodily manifestations that impact the felt experience of others. Um, she defines injustice in terms of processes that disrupt the sense-making of emotions, depriving emotions of their force. I have also done work on um, emotional injustice together with Irina Pismeni and Jesse Prince, but the paper is not published yet. I hope it's going to be published sometime. Um, we rely largely on uh, Misha Cherry's understanding of affective injustice or emotional injustice, um, who defines different stages at which emotions might be subject to external regulation. Um, Cherry distinguished three stages at which interference with emotions can be problematic. That's recognition, strategy, and implementation. Um, and the way we defined that in our work uh, was elicitation, uh, perception, and uptake of emotion. So first, akin to Cherry's recognition state, the emotion may be perceived by others, allowing them to ascribe an emotion to the uh, emoter. And next, there's uptake of that emotion. Uh, observers may, for example, ignore the emotion or respond to it. And um, prior to any of this, there is um, the case that the emotion must have been elicited. Um, some event or behavior by another party caused the emotion to occur. Uh, at longer timescales, we can also think of the inculcation of norms that affect which emotions are likely to arise in a given individual or a group. Beyond those standing norms, there may also be more specific situational demands placed on the individual, which may or may not succeed in elicitation of an emotional response. response. Um, marginalization, marginalization, I think, can take place at any of those stages. We can also discuss later how, um, what exactly the connection between marginalization and injustice is. I defined it now as a kind of injustice, uh, but it's something I'm still thinking about. I'm not sure that's uh, the right way to put it, actually. OK, so um, how does emotional marginalization apply to disabled and trans identities? Um, I think there are three general ways to put it. Um, wait, I think I skipped one slide. Right. OK, I skipped one slide. So um, I also thought about why does emotional marginalization occur 
And I think the answer is quite obvious because there's certain norms established in societies that provide us with guidance through social interactions mostly. Um, but we can also take a deeper look into that and, uh, for example, go into gender and look at how different genders are socialized to occupy different roles, motives, goals, and self schemas. Uh, there's, for example, work by Brody and Hall that looks into that um, and looks into how, for example, there are self schemas for women, such as um, taking roles, intimacy motives, and then there's um, self schemas for men such as like provider roles and uh, control motives. Um, each identity may be associated with different patterns of emotional functioning because of different social expectations, display rules, functions, motives, and goals that correspond to each identity. Uh, thus, different emotional processes may occur depending on the particular identity that is salient in a given context. In any given interaction, gender stereotypes can generate expectancies about our same and other gender partners that in turn influence and elicit particular behaviors and emotional expressions. Um, that's work that has been done by Hall and Brighton in emotion theory. So yeah, the general upshot is norms play a role for how emotions are experienced, expressed, and recognized. And then that obviously also applies to disabled and trans identities who are affected by emotional marginalization. Um, there are, I think, three general ways we can look at emotional marginalization of disabled and trans identities. Um, that is, first of all, there's an elicitation, the elicitation of negative emotions, for example, due to discriminatory situations, um, negative in the sense that it affects the way um, we interact in a specific situation. It might inhibit or suppress, uh, suppress certain emotions or certain behaviors. Um, second, there is there might be emotional display that's different from peers due to expectations, due to disability, due to internalized roles, and meaning there's emotional display that's not falling into the realm of what's typically defined as appropriate for a specific emotion. And third, there's uh, the recognition of emotions that can be inhibited or filtered through the marginalization status. Um, let's look at some examples of what this means in detail. Um, they're not really connected or structured in any way, so I'm sorry about that, I, but it's seven examples and um, I'll present each of those and then we can discuss those later in the q and I think. Okay, the first one is um, there's this trope or narrative of um, disabled people being inspirational, um, um, glorified, lavishly lauded in the press and on television. That's been talked about by Shapiro and Sammy Shock. Uh, so disability, according to Shock, gets associated with heroism, overcoming adversity, individual achievement, and inspiration, uh, which in general, I think, leads to an individualization of um, the concept. Um, the material conditions and other forms of systemic oppression suffered by disabled people are not given nearly as much attention as the individuals supposedly overcoming their disabilities. Uh, given the stereotype, the emotional regulation expected from a disabled individual is suppressing negative emotions and replacing them with positive ones, such as confidence and enthusiasm. Uh, this suggests that disabled people should take life in stride for the comfort of others. So that's the first example. The second is um, taken from psychoanalysis, um, something that came to my mind. It's uh, Freud's patient, Dora. Um, Dora seems to have suffered sexual assault from her father's friend, uh, Mr. K. And that resulted Dora in having a variety of symptoms, including a loss of voice. While treating Dora, Freud diagnosed her with hysteria, 
caused by her jealousy and sexual attraction for Mr. K. By doing so, he attributed symptoms, the symptoms not to the sexual assault suffered by Dora, but instead to the inner workings of her mind. Uh, Freud does not interpret this situation as traumatic, but instead finds the underlying causes in Dora herself, implying that her version of events and the resulting emotions are delusional. So he misattributes the symptoms and misrecognizes Dora's emotional experience. Uh, in the work with Pismanian prints, we call that uh, emotion gaslighting. My third example is connected to the second. Um, I'm not sure it's the same. Um, it's um, about emotions being distorted by being viewed through the medical lens, by being regarded as symptoms of a disability. And the example could be um, depression getting merely treated as a chemical imbalance in all cases, uh, which it might be true for some cases, but not for, alls, uh, for all. So yeah, sometimes emotions are distorted by being viewed through a medical lens as they are regarded as symptoms of a condition or of something that's classified in the DSM typically, uh, or by being regarded as symptoms of a disability. Uh, I think we can also apply this to um, being trans because it's um, still uh, something that's classified in the DSM uh, or classified as a condition, so to say. Um, this form of injustice um, can be perpetrated by medical professionals as when clinicians treat depression, depression as a chemical imbalance, even in cases where life circumstances are clearly to blame. Um, another connected example is my fourth example, um, that's transmedicalism, um, which results in presumptive unhappiness prior to, or yeah, assuming an unhappiness in trans people prior to medical transition. Um, so transmedicalism assumes that every trans person in order to be trans has to pursue medical transition. Um, and that um, results in assuming an unhappiness in trans people who are not undergoing medical transition or prior to medical transition. Um, we have that manifested, for example, in Germany um, as the health insurance here requires suffering um, in order to be eligible for uh, medical transition, such as surgeries and uh, hormone replacement therapy. My fifth example is a lack of concepts to communicate emotions. So some individuals lack concepts for feelings they experience, which leaves them unequipped to address them. Um, a person without the concept of a certain disability might may mistake psychological symptoms for bodily aches or bodily aches for psychological symptoms. Um, someone without the concept of gender dysphoria may be slow to recognize an underlying dissatisfaction with their assigned gender or sex. Um, for another example, we can consider um, also gender, um, consider the fact that men are often discouraged from talking about their emotions. Um, that's been coined in the literature as a normative alexithymia. Um, and that can lead to failures of insight and communication and disadvantage um, the people who are lacking those specific concepts. Um, my favorite example, I think, is specific emotions um, and uh, the specific emotion of romantic love. Um, I think specific emotions come with restricted access for disabled and trans identities. And love, I think, is um, quite an obvious example, uh, but also very um, critical, I think, or a lot of people criticize um, that um, analysis of love. Um, we can look at love um, from a societal lens. So there are societal aspects like social status, looks, 
um, that render a person lovable in society's eyes. That's something that um, Avril has done work on. Um, then there's also the aspect of not being seen for who one is, but being seen as an object of one's disability, for example, or one's being trans. And I think that can be summarized as being seen as other. Um, then there's also the issue of uh, restricted access to sex and the desexualization of disabled people that uh, Siebers has done work on, for example, and that also often is connected to romantic love, not always, but often. Um, trans people, for example, are often not implicated in people's sexual identities because people have an incorrect understanding of trans identities. Um, they may consider everyone who is trans to be of the same gender or to be of an extra gender, and thus also fail to understand that someone who is trans can be a homosexual man. Um, as a consequence, I think trans people are not considered to be as lovable as cis people, um, and that manifests a restricted access to romantic love. Um, yeah, my last example concerns um, how to how um, cis people and able people deal with. Um, the restricted access um, to emotions that disabled and trans people might have. Um, for example, um, they could ignore emotional the emotional coast of or not be fully aware of the emotional coasts of uh, stuff like misgendering, uh, unwanted attention, and invasive questions, and um, demanding explanation explanations or demanding what's been uh, coined as emotional labor um, constantly from trans and disabled identities. Okay, that's all the examples I have. Uh, I hope we can talk about them more in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, I have a question to start us off which is, um, so you mentioned at the beginning, the th sort of three stages uh, of emotion that, that Cherry posits, um, which were elicitation, uh, kind of uh, like uptake and response. And I, there are some cases where I, I have trouble figuring out like which stage is responsible for a particular injustice. So uh, I'm thinking of examples where like it's deprecated for people from a marginalized identity group to be angry. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, people might, when they feel anger, sort of attempt to conceal it so that not getting uptake is like in the context an advantage. Like, like so do I, do I locate the problem at the elicitation stage where the situation is that makes them angry at the uptake stage where it actually seems like not getting uptake is maybe an advantage given everything else that's going on or in the response stage where like an anticipated negative response is, is harmful? Yeah, thank you. I think most issues are located in all three areas. I don't think we can clearly separate them um, for each given instance uh, of emotion. Um, I think it's difficult enough to do that when an emotion goes the typical way and is taken up in a typical way. I think even there, we can clearly differentiate um, those stages from one another. Um, so I'm, yeah, I think it's not possible. <laughs> I'm not sure it has to be possible in order to be analyzed properly. Um, I think we can always say there are problems occurring at different stages and we can think of examples and then yeah, try our best to figure them out by examples. That, that makes sense. Uh, I see that we've got a question from uh, Amandine who writes, thank you so much for your excellent talk. I wonder if you could say more about your concept of emotional gaslighting and how we can avoid this concept being co-opted by say cis white men to justify their anger at feminist progress. It seems like a very important and progressive concept, and it would be problematic if it were instrumentalized to try to justify the status quo instead. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I'm not sure it's in my control whether people instrumentalize concepts for their own sake or not. I think to some extent, I, I don't really see myself being responsible for that, I think. Um, so I guess any concept could be sort of instrumentalized for um, outside of their own its purpose, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I see that out of my control. Uh, I'm not sure how to adjust a concept so that it doesn't really get appropriated in that way. <clears throat> um, I haven't thought about emotion gaslighting. The way I thought about all these examples, uh, all these cases is by way of approaching them through examples. And I haven't like explored them in enough detail to say a lot about them. Um, I think the emotion gaslighting example reflects um, a lot of what happens can happen in medical contexts contexts um, to people who are classified as a certain condition along the lines of the DSM. Um, but it, I guess it can also happen because um, those narratives are being taken up by society in general. So I guess that can also happen in more private contexts um, and less like structured contexts. Um, and I guess there is a big possibility for this um, concept to be like misattributed or to be um, taken, yeah, to be misattributed, I think. Um, but I'm not sure how to control that other than trying to say very specifically what is meant by emotion gaslighting. I have kind of a related question, actually. Uh, which is like in all of your examples, I, I basically agree with you about what's going on and that it's unjust. But I don't have as vivid a picture of like what a, a society that structured itself justly around emotions would look like. And like, I, I don't know if I need one or if I should just troubleshoot and like see what happens. Do, do you have thoughts about like how I should think about justice as well as injustice? I don't have any thoughts about justice, I think. <laughs> um, I think I'm mostly concerned with looking at how the world is and like trying to analyze that. Um, that's what interests me. Um, I don't, for me, it's not imaginable to, yeah, for me, it's not possible to think about a world where there are the norms we have apply to everyone <clears throat> in the same way. Um, so it's very complicated to think about um, having a world only with just emotions. I, I don't know how that would look like, actually. <laughs> that's, that's pretty fair, and I don't want to <laughs> ask for the moon. Uh, I think Jonathan has a question. Yeah, thank you. I, just, just before I ask it to add a comment to that last exchange, I, in, in many, many areas of philosophy, I think we're realizing you can say an awful lot about injustice without having a clear view about what a just world would be or um, think that um, the many ways in which the world is manifestly unjust without having an eye, any type of ideal theory at all. So I'm completely with you methodologically on that. Um, but, I, but I want to take up an invitation you gave us, I think, Jen, at the, the end of the talk, because you, the last couple of uh, sections you talked about emotional marginalization, I think, and, and gave three mechanisms or, or, or three ways in which it happens. One was through negative emotions, another uh, different emotions, and then filter through marginalization to summarize very quickly. Then you gave us a seven examples. And I, th I think you said at that point, you're, you're not clear or you, or you weren't going to tell us um, how the examples relate to the mechanisms. And um, I, I wondered what we should make of that. I mean, is it because it, this is an early stage in the inquiry or is it just the wrong way to think about it so that perhaps they don't map on so neatly or they use more than one? 
Um, mm. So yeah. I, I don't know if you have a type of worked example where you could you, you could work back from the example you give to one of the mechanisms, or just say a little bit more about the relation between the mechanisms and the examples. If I've I may have misunderstood what you were doing, but um, just, just to have some more on that would be very helpful. I, yes, thank you. I think it's largely due to this being in the early stages um, of its development. Um, the three stages I define are basically what's understood in emotion theory as the three main aspects of how we can look at emotion, at emotion or how we can approach um, analysis of emotion. So we can look at it from the inside, from what, where, where does it come from? Why does it occur? How is an emotion elicited? And we can look at how is it expressed? Uh, what does that signal to other people? And we can also look at how is it taken up? So how is, it, how is emotion recognized uh, and interpreted by other people? Uh, and that's the three stages basically I took to um, define these three general stages of how emotional marginalization can take place um, because it, yeah, I think that makes, that's how it makes sense to me. Um, I guess you can take those examples and look at at what stage um, does the marginalization uh, manifest. Um, and maybe that's something I will do in the paper. Um, but as I already said um, to the question Ray asked, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to define it so clearly because um, these different stages are um, overlapping in a certain sense. Um, in real life examples, at least they're overlapping and we can't clearly differentiate um, where does an elicitation take place and when does an expression start. So it's really difficult to differentiate those different stages in real life cases. Um, but yeah, I think it would be useful to try and map those onto those different stages um, as you suggested and look at um, if that makes sense in the paper. So I, I, I think I would encourage you to um, maybe go a bit further and, mm -hmm. and think of your, examples maybe even as a test of the theory rather than thinking that you know that there's this well-established theory and you have to fit your examples into it into it one way or another because after <clears throat> you know, after all everything here is fluid and it, if it turns out that um, some of your examples don't fit very well into that framework you, you might think well the three stages enough the four or mm -hmm. other other things that one might include so i think you should um yeah, uh, you should try to be creative here ra rather than thinking you've got a fixed framework that you need to use. I mean, it may turn out that the framework works beautifully. And I think, as, as you say, um, and, and as you said in discussion with Ray, it's very, very unlikely you're going to have a, a sort of a very clear one-one mapping, that, that there's, there's going to be elements of different things, different cases. But some of the cases seem simple. I mean, the, the um, was it the first one of the inspirational a disability a disabled person as an inspirational person i mean that seems so common and clear so if you think about say paralympic sports for example when uh, any paralympic athlete is on tv in the uk it's always you know they've overcome this burden in order to have done this remarkable thing um so that that feels like quite a simple case and you might be able to map that one on, onto one of the stages, uh, but other cases involving you know, complex emotions, it feels like you know, you're going to need more material to categorize them. Anyway, that, that, that's yep. just to sort of riff a bit on, on uh, the last section of the talk. I'll hand back to Ray. Now, unless, Jen, you want to come back? Oh. Um, no, that's great. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Uh... I didn't think of the framework as something that's fixed and that I have to comply to, right. but rather in the way that you suggested um, that I think those examples are a test case for and that we can look at <clears throat> the examples and then uh, see if the theory actually makes sense. So thank you. We have a question from Morgan. 
who writes, where do you see the concept of emotional marginalization going in the future? What are the next steps for the philosophy of emotional marginalization and other disciplines? Thank you. I think first the concept actually has to be understood better because there's very few work or very little work on um, this domain of emotional marginalization of um, affective injustice or emotional injustice. Um, it's something that's only developing now um, slowly or like it has been developing for a while, but it's been taken up very slowly and not really uh, given attention to at least an emotion theory. Um, it might have been given attention to in um, marginalized theory. Uh, so I guess in the margins, obviously you have to pay attentions, attention to those things. Uh, but what I wish for is that this um, also gets attention in classical emotion theory. Um, at least in the sense that um, there are people who present on that stuff at conferences and such. I don't require everyone to work on that. Obviously, I think that's uh, utopian, but um, I think it should at least be given attention to. And I hope, I think actually that's going to happen um, at some point um, because we do see that um, more and more people start to think about effective injustice from uh, different angles. And yeah, so I hope uh, that development is going further. So we have a follow-up from Amandine on uh, her question about emotional gaslighting. Uh, she writes, thank you for your answer to my question. For what it's worth, I think your idea of specifying the concept of emotional gaslighting would be a useful way to avoid the problem of co-optation, perhaps by referring to standpoint theory which avoids the problem of relativism when it comes to characterizing the status quo as unjust. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, so if anybody else would like to, uh, to post a question, we've got a bit more time. Jen, you, you've obviously convinced us all that uh, th this is it. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and, and, and that, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, may, maybe I, I could just ask uh, if there's anything you'd like to expand on, anything you thought we would ask you about, and um, we, we failed that test. I don't think so. Um, I'm not sure if I expected you to ask about anything. Um, no, it's really something very new for me. And I was um, usually at the beginning of thinking something through and really struggling with putting it into a structure that makes sense to anyone. Um, because there's so many ways you could actually go deeper on that um, project. I think that I'm trying to sort of stay on track and really only look at stuff that's important to understand emotional marginalization of disabled and trans identity specifically. I think one issue, um, maybe I would have expected this to come up, maybe um, the issue of what's specific about emotional marginalization of disabled and trans identities, or is that something that um, is disabled and trans identity something we should put together or is that um, should we look at these identities each uh, on their own? I think that's something I expected to come up. Um, Can I just jump in and, and um, say that that's um, almost exactly the sort of direction my question would have taken you in because I wanted to ask you um, how you think that um, what you're doing um, is distinct from um, motion theory that's being directed and formulated around um, 
identities and uh, perceptions and values, et cetera, of non-disabled people? Mm -hmm. Mm, well, I think it's distinct because usually emotion theory doesn't look at uh, disabled people and at trans identities or at uh, marginalized perspectives in general. Um, and it doesn't really take into account that emotion experiences are different from another depending on individual, the individual. Um, and also that emotion recognition depends on the individual context to a very large extent. <clears throat> the way classical emotion theory would, would usually argue is that they would say, um, yeah, context is important, but we have this norm of how emotions are and how emotions go about. And I don't think that's the case, actually. I think emotions are defined by um, context, such as individual context. So I have one more question, uh, which is about the, the kind of recognition step again. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of there's a kind of problem that's adjacent to some of your cases. Mm -hmm. um, so particularly the kind of like disability inspiration case where uh, somebody who's not from a marginalized group will sort of demand too much from uh, the person from the marginalized group. So they want to know like all about like the, the struggles you overcame or like the intimate feelings of being trans where that's not appropriate and like how does how does that fit into your framework and is that one of the things you want to cover mm, yes I think that's covered by the last example I gave of um, cis people ignoring the emotional cost of asking invasive questions or demanding um, emotional labor if we want to frame it like that or demanding explanations um, it's I think, well, um, that could elicit, those reactions itself can elicit um, negative emotions that also um, inhibit the ways we are able to interact or we are able to proceed with um, social interactions. Because obviously, um, cis people and able people do not, uh, non-disabled people do not um, get asked about these things um, and then they can just proceed with the social interaction um, normally. Um, so there is, there could be negative emotions that are elicited um, by those inv invasive questions and demanding explanations and stuff. Um, and that's, that's something that gets ignored by cis people and non-disabled people. I feel like there's another aspect to it, which is like, just like you don't have a right to somebody's emotions in the first place, regardless of the effects. Yeah. Uh, but that's compatible with what you said. Yes, I think so. Um, yeah, that's a good, good, good point, actually. <laughs> uh, so we've got a question from Maeve O'Donovan, who writes, thank you for introducing me to an entirely new area of thought. It will take me a bit to wrap my head around it, but the category of emotional marginalization seems incredibly useful. What are some of the salient differences in how it operates with trans and disabled persons? In other words, what links them in your talk and what challenges that link? Yeah, that's, that's the thing I have to think more about that I haven't wrapped my head around that. <clears throat> that's why I said, I think um, I expected um, this question to come up more uh, or at all. Um, now it's come up, <laughs> so thank you. I do not have a clear answer to that yet, um, as it's something I yet have to wrap my head around, and I think it's going to be very complicated. Um, if we work our way from examples up, so to say, I think um, there's ultimately going to be very different examples that will provide us with different uh, ways of thinking about emotional marginalization or also different ways of thinking about um, how emotions take place, actually. So uh, it's 10 minutes to the hour, which I believe is the time that this session is uh, scheduled to end. 
Um, thank you so much for the talk. Thank you to all the, the uh, questioners and I'll let us end on time. Thank you much. So very much, uh, Rafe, Jering and Jen for an amazing paper. You can see from the comments in the chat that um, this is very new to a lot of people. And um, I, I think uh, people still trying to get the measure of um, what you know, your what you've achieved in this talk and how they might be able to use it in their own work and more importantly even in their own lives too.